Meeting is being recorded. And I'd like to acknowledge today is 9-11 and um, I debated as to whether to cancel the program or not and just do it another day. But I think it's, it's important to keep that in the back of our mind as we go through this day. And I'd like to also acknowledge all the partners that helped Day in the Woods happen. Um, it's, it's an amazingly collaborative effort and it's really neat to see everybody pull together to make this happen. If you need any information about Day in the Woods, including this program, all the recordings will be here. There'll be one link, just go to this page and you can find anything you need related to the program. Any extra materials that we have available after today will be available here. Um, the tentative agenda that's left for the year, we're gonna look at mapping your woodland on October 9th. We're gonna introduce you to some software with GPS and with some online mapping programs that are out there. So keep that in mind on October 9th. And then we're, we're thinking we're gonna end the year on November 13th with a winter tree identification, but keep, stay tuned. We may add some programs through the winter months. Just a reminder, we do have a lot of resources and videos now, a lot of tree ID clips on that same site. And we've got a, a Facebook presence. We, in, we introduce a new tree ID clip every Tuesday. We're calling it Tremendous Tuesday. So if you wanna to go to that site, you can learn more. Um, Woodland Stewards is another great effort. They're doing a lot of programming, especially on Fridays, Escape to the Forest Fridays, and lots of materials available on this site. And then their Facebook page as well. And with that, I'm gonna mute my mic and turn it over to Marnie. Thanks, Dave. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all uh, for being here, especially uh, this day. I just wanted to um, briefly talk about the program and kind of how it came about, and then uh, just kind of quickly go over our agenda before I turn it over to our first speaker. So as Dave said, today's topic is forest and wildlife history and future challenges. Uh, Mark Wiley with the Division of Wildlife and I put this program together. And uh, I'll be honest, it was a bit challenging because this is a big topic to cover, um, but it's one that we both felt was um, very relevant. And, and maybe the history of our Ohio forests and our wildlife populations are something that some of you maybe haven't had an opportunity to learn much about. So um, we we're both excited to kind of uh, to introduce this topic to you. So uh, as you're looking at, that's our agenda for the program today. We're gonna get started with um, Tom Macy and then Mark is going to follow up with wildlife history and trends. And uh, Dave, if you can advance to the next slide. We also put together um, a few complimentary um, videos to go along with this topic. So along with history, we wanted to incorporate a, a future challenges uh, aspect to this program. And uh, some of our speakers this morning will be addressing that too, but um, Steve Matthews with the Ohio State University School of Environment and Natural Resources, he um, did a webinar recently on the impacts of climate change on forests and wildlife. Um, and it was extremely interesting. We did it last Friday. So hopefully if you, um, uh, haven't already checked that out, you will do so. Um, I highly recommend it. And then I also put together um, a shorter video on the impacts of non-native invasive species on wildlife, just giving some a little bit of those examples as to some of those in, impacts that um, our non-native invasive species are having on wildlife, as, as that is uh, one of our future challenges. Um, and I forgot I didn't introduce myself. I should have done that. Um, I am with OSU Extension and the School of Environment and Natural Resources, and I'm the Wildlife Pro Program Specialist for the state. So, all right, um, let's get started with our, our first speaker. We're going to have Tom Macy. Tom is the Forest Health Program Manager with the uh, Division of, uh, of uh, Forestry. We, um, he worked on this presentation with Cotton Randall, um, but Cotton was recently called out west on fire duty. Hopefully he's safe and all, but uh, Tom thankfully uh, was able to step in and cover for him. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tom. Thank you for being here. All right, thank you, Marnie and Dave for the introductions. Um, yes, as Marnie said, my name is Tom Macy. I'm not Cotton Randall, as this, uh, this slide here suggests. Um, I'm the Forest Health Program Administrator with ODNR Division of Forestry. 
um, and Cotton was originally slated to do the talk, but as of yesterday, he's headed out west on a, a wildfire assignment. So um, I am standing in for him on this talk here. I hope I do it justice. Uh, I've reviewed the slides. I'm pretty familiar with most of the material, so hopefully I can, it can be a, a seamless transition here. So talking about the state of Ohio's forests, uh, just starting off here with uh, benefits and services that forests provide us with here in Ohio. So, you know, native plants provide habitat. We've got wood products from trees, uh, wildlife habitat, recreational use, whether it's hiking, mountain biking, horseback riding, um, water quality, forest uh, filter water and really improve the quality of drinking water uh, for humans, but also uh, for habitat for wildlife. Uh, aesthetic beauty of forests that people enjoy as well. Um, trees and forests in urban and residential areas are extremely important as well. Uh, not only for aesthetic reasons, but um, you know, the shading that trees provide to buildings really reduces energy costs. Uh, they can also capture stormwater runoff um, and improve air quality as well. And we've also got non-timber forest products, things like uh, sugar maple, uh, maple sugar, uh, and, and woodland mushroom collecting and things like that. So looking back uh, in time, if we go back sort of a timeline through Ohio's history, uh, the settlement of Marietta was the first uh, city founded in the state back in 1788 before Ohio was even a state. Um, at that time, Ohio was mostly covered with, with forests, uh, approximately 95% forested. That other 5% was probably, uh, you know, wetlands up in the northwestern part of the state, especially, uh, and some little prairie remnant, uh, prairie, prairie pockets uh, in the western half of the state. But predominantly forested at that time. Uh, by 1930, with, uh, with a lot of uh, European American settlement um, and logging of, of our forests, we were down to about 15% forested, 13% uh, forested in 1942. And present day, 2016, we're up to about 30% forest cover for the state, which is about 8 million acres. Um, so this is a little animation just sort of showing that uh, rebound and forest cover in the state, you know, going back from 1940 to the mid 90s. Um, and really that's, that's kind of where we are today, uh, pretty similar to the mid 90s. We've sort of uh, seemingly plateaued in that amount of forest cover. Um, and a lot of this you know, a lot of the, the forests were originally cleared to make way for agriculture and farming. Um, and, you know, in a lot of places in the state, especially the, the unglaciated, uh, more hill country of the state, it wasn't really prime ground for farming. Uh, so a lot of those farms were abandoned and allowed to revert back into forest cover. Um, and now, you know, whenever we're seeing uh, reverting farmland back to forest, that acreage tends to be offset elsewhere where we're losing forest cover mostly due to urbanization and expanding urban areas. So it appears that we've, we've sort of plateaued in that forest cover rebound in Ohio. So here's where we are today. This is uh, mapping uh, by the USGS, the National Land Cover Database. Um, and we can see there uh, in green forest cover in the state, uh, predominantly in the southeastern part of the state is where most of the large tracts of forests occur. Um, and we can see agriculture, agriculture being about 50% of Ohio's uh, land cover. And the developed open water and wetlands are also shown here. So, 
So when we think about Ohio's forests, um, it's important to consider who is owning that forest land in the state. Uh, and the vast majority of Ohio's forests are privately owned. Um, so on this chart here, we can see the top bar are family forests. And family owned forests account for about 70% of Ohio's forest land. Um, and then the other private ownerships on this chart are the corporate at 12% and other private at 3%. So collectively, the private lands accounts for about 85% of Ohio's forests are privately owned. And that leaves 15%, which is that state, federal, and local ownership there uh, in public ownership. So the, the state would be, you know, agencies like ODNR, state forests, state parks, uh, nature preserves, wildlife areas. Uh, the federal land ownership also includes the Wayne National Forest. Uh, and a note there as well that other private would include conservation organizations and uh, unincorporated clubs and partnerships. So when we look at the private land ownership, which is 85% of the forest, most of that private land ownership is in family forest ownership. So now looking specifically at that 70% of family forest ownership, uh, let's break that down a little bit. So this chart here shows um, the size of the forest property holdings in that family forest ownership. So we can see the 10 to 19 acre class at the bottom uh, and then those larger property size classes going up. And within each of those size classes, we can see how many ownerships there are and how much acreage of all of Ohio falls within that uh, size class. So we can see looking at that 10 to 19 acre uh, forest holding, that's where most of the ownerships occur. So most landowners uh, are owning 10 to 19 acres of forest. Uh, and if we look at the acreage, you know, a lot of the forest acreage falls in that 10 up to 100 acre uh, property size class. So just some bullet points there on the right. Um, there are about 336,000 family forest owners in Ohio. Um, a lot of those occur in what we call the rural urban interface. So sort of those expanding areas where um, urban areas are moving out into more rural areas. Uh, and we have about 145,000 owners that own 10 acres or more. So there's a good chunk of landowners that aren't represented in that chart that actually own less than 10 acres. Um, and then looking at the, the greater than 10 acre ownership, the average parcel size is 34 acres. So most landowners own relatively small tracts of forest land. Um, and that, that can present some challenges when, you know, you want to implement large scale management or projects across a large area of forest, you've got a lot of landowners to, to get on the same page with, with that, that management. So um, this is some data that we have from the US Forest Service National Woodland Owner Survey. Um, and it, it uh, basically, you know, is a survey of woodland owners and, and what they do on their land, why they own their forest land, uh, you know, what activities they've done. So this shows uh, activities that woodland owners have done on their property in the last five years. Um, so lots of owners and on a lot of acres, we see uh, recreational use occurring. Uh, also, cutting trees for personal use is pretty common. Uh, and some other things listed there, uh, creation of trails, uh, promoting wildlife habitat, uh, managing invasive species, and, and other things listed there as well. Um, the categories are not exclusive, so there could be multiple of these activities occurring on the same acre by the same owner. But just some interesting information there to see how, how family forest owners in Ohio are, are utilizing their property. 
uh, some more data from that survey. Um, in most cases, uh, the woods that folks own are either uh, part of their home property, they live on that property, or it's a far part of the farm that they own. Uh, the average tenure of those lands is about 23 years. The average woodland owner age is 62.9 years. Uh, and it's predominantly uh, white males that are owning those forests and 39% having a college degree. So some interesting demographic uh, statistics about um, private woodland ownership in Ohio. Uh, so thinking a little bit about fragmentation of Ohio's forests, this can be really important and fragmentation is basically the, the breaking up of larger tracts of forests into smaller tracts. And that can happen uh, with things like roads, uh, utility right-of-ways, uh, or just land clearing for uh, development where we're losing forest cover. Um, so we have some, some spatial data also linked with census data where people live and housing density uh, to come up with this, what's known as a wildland urban interface. So it does take into account housing density uh, in proximity to forest cover. So that's how this map was developed. And on this map, we can see uh, forest cover in the state that's considered wildland urban interface. And that's what's shown in that dark red color. And the forests that are in more rural areas away from more of that housing density uh, is considered non wildland urban interface. Um, and we can see we have data and the data comes each uh, census year. So we have data going back to 1990, uh, 2000 and 2010 when the census happened. Um, so we can see that the amount of wildland urban interface forest is increasing over time in Ohio. And that just shows you that Ohio's forests are becoming more fragmented. There, are, there is more development moving out into some of these more rural forested areas in the state. And in fact, Ohio has one of the highest rates of increasing wildland urban interface of any state in the Northeast. And so this can be a concern, um, not only just for loss of forest cover, uh, but also for facilitation of invasive species colonization. Uh, when you get fragmented forests, there's more edge, um, you know, more opportunities for these invasive plants to take hold uh, or invasive insects or diseases or other animals. Uh, there's also implications for wildlife that you know, there's some wildlife that require larger contiguous blocks of forest. Uh, and when it gets fragmented up, uh, that the species really don't utilize that habitat anymore. So there's, there's a lot of implications for this fragmentation of forest. Um, so this is data that we have from the US Forest Service uh, Forest Inventory and Analysis Program, the FIA program. Um, and they it's, this is one of the best data sources that we have on forests across the country. Um, they have a network uh, in Ohio. There's thousands of permanent plots that they return to uh, every few years and actually physically are measuring trees, recording the species that occur there. We, we're tracking over time uh, how these metrics are changing. So in this chart here, uh, we can see, you know, we can basically categorize a stand of, of forest trees by their size, the size, the physical size of those trees. Um, and we can call them large diameter stands, medium diameter or small diameter, uh, or non-stocked. And so we have data here from 1991, 2006, and 2016. Uh, and we can see that the large diameter stands are increasing over time. Uh, medium diameter are staying fairly uh, consistent and small diameter stands are decreasing. And this is just an indication of maturing forests in general. So, you know, most of Ohio's forests are maturing, the trees are growing larger, 
and that's reflected here in this data. And we have fewer small diameter trees. Um, and so that in general indicates most of Ohio's forests are maturing and growing. Um, this chart here is also from the FIA program. Uh, and this is data of a 10 year period from 2006 to 2016. And it's showing us uh, the volume in trees of given diameter classes uh, over that 10 year period. So in Ohio, if we look at those small diameter classes, your six inch trees up to 12 inch trees, um, over that 10 year period, there's actually less volume, a, a, a reduction in volume in those size classes over time. Whereas if we look at these larger trees, 16 up to 23 inches and larger, we're seeing increases in volume in trees of that size. And again, this is another indication of a maturing forest. Uh, we're seeing trees growing larger and larger, and we're seeing less small trees over time. That's what this indicates more so than something like, uh, you know, we're removing uh, smaller trees through timber harvest or something like that. Um, Similar to the, the size class of the forest stands, we can look at stand age class. So they're actually aging trees, you know, taking cores of the trees and seeing how old they are. Um, and we see a similar trend here. So this is also data uh, from 2006, 2011, and 2016. So over that 10 year period, uh, we can see in those older age classes, so those you know, 60 to 100 year old uh, forests, we're, we're seeing increases. So more older forests. And in those younger forests, the zero to 60 year forests, uh, we're seeing less of those over that time period. So most trees are growing larger, growing older uh, in the state. And on the the y-axis there, we can see how much of Ohio's forests are made up by that age class of tree. Um, so we can see most of Ohio's forests are falling in that 40 to 80 year range. Um, and comparatively, we don't have a lot of really young forests, the zero to 20 year old forests, or a very old forest, the 100 plus year old forests. Um, what about species composition? So what, what species of tree are making up Ohio's forests? And this is just a snapshot of a handful of, of common tree species uh, going back to 1952 uh, up until 2018. And we can see over time uh, a pretty significant reduction in the proportion of oaks in Ohio's forests. We do see maples on the rise uh, and there's some other species there to consider, uh, yellow poplar, hickories, and elms. Uh, elm has dropped pretty significantly since the 50s because of Dutch elm disease. Um, but the, the, the changes here are, are a little bit concerning um, in some respects that we're, we're losing some of those oaks. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And maples seem to be on the rise. Um, this is another chart showing a similar thing, but this is just a snapshot for uh, 2018. Um, and these, these bars here represent the tree size. Uh, so on the left, the left two bars are seedlings and saplings. So you're really small trees. And going up uh, to the right, we've got progressively larger size classes. So five to 10.9 inch, all the way up to larger than a 29 inch diameter tree. Uh, and what, what species are making up those size classes? So looking over at the seedlings, um, you know, at the bottom in that orange and green color are the red oaks and white oaks. Uh, those are making up a pretty small proportion of the seedlings and saplings. Uh, and if we look at the maples, which are the, the brown and red color there, sugar maple and red maple, those are a much larger uh, component of the seedlings and saplings than oaks. 
Uh, and we sort of see the reverse of that when we get into the larger tree size classes. Uh, you know, almost 50% of our trees uh, greater than 29 inches are oaks in Ohio. Uh, and a very small proportion of those large trees are maples, um, you know, less than 10%. So, you know, what, what's going on here? Why are we seeing this trend? Um, and a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, historical disturbances and land use in Ohio. Uh, oaks require a certain amount of sunlight to become established. They really won't germinate or grow into the canopy in a, in a closed canopy shaded forest, uh, whereas maples can. They're, they're much more shade tolerant. And so, you know, really a lot of this has to do with um, fire suppression that happened uh, in the early 1900s. There was a lot of aggressive uh, suppression of fire. Uh, and, you know, a lot of forests just maturing and not having any kind of disturbance to allow more sunlight in to let those oaks regenerate. Um, so that, that is an issue. And if we look at this chart, you can almost imagine over time these bars kind of moving to the right as these trees grow larger. So it's a little bit of a concern there that we're, we're losing oaks and we may not have them quite as prevalent in Ohio's forests in the future. And this is a trend that's happening across uh, the northeastern part of the country and in most states are seeing this similar trend. Uh, this chart here shows um, the gross growth. So what all the volume growth occurring on trees in Ohio's forests in a given year, uh, as well as the volume that uh, dies, so the mortality volume how many trees are dying in a given year, as, as well as removals. So how much harvesting removal volume is taken out of Ohio's forests every year. Um, so we do see a slight uptick in mortality and removals uh, over the last few years. And actually a good portion of that is due to emerald ash borer uh, killing a lot of ash trees in Ohio. And you know, as a result of that, we do see a slight decrease in the gross growth occurring in Ohio's forests over time. So again, looking at uh, growth removals and mortality volume, this is broken down by species. Um, so you could almost say this, the species that are doing the best and having the most growth over time are near the top of this chart. Uh, and we see the red maple and sugar maple right at the top. Um, so they're, they're doing quite well. We can see their net growth there. The blue bar uh, is pretty, pretty high relative to their removals and mortality, which is the sort of the orange and, and green bars. Um, and then at the bottom, the species that, you know, are losing volume or not growing quite as well uh, are things like ash, elm, and alarmingly, a couple oak species, so white oak and chestnut oak. And the, the number in parentheses after the, the species name is their, um, their growth to removal ratio. So those at a, at a ratio of one are staying constant. Above one, they're increasing. Uh, below one, they're, they're decreasing. So they're having a ne negative net change. Um, so that's a little bit concerned for some of those species. Uh, and if you look at ash, white ash, for example, uh, we actually see negative net growth um, because that the mortality volume is so great. And that's due, mainly due to emerald ash borer. So a summary here uh, for Ohio's forest, uh, about 30% of Ohio is forested. It's about 8 million acres. And that's pretty much the same since 1991. That stayed fairly constant. Uh, the southeastern part of the state being the most heavily forested. Um, the vast majority of Ohio's forests are privately owned, 85% privately owned. Of those privately owned forests, 70% are in family forest ownership. Uh, and the majority of those family forests are fairly small parcel sizes, less than 50 acres in size. So Ohio's forests are also fragmented. 
uh, and seem to be becoming more fragmented over time. Uh, the forests are maturing and we're seeing some shifts in species composition over time. Uh, we're also continuing to see an annual increase in volume on Ohio's forests, about 0.4%. Although this annual increase in volume, uh, the rate of increase has decreased since 2010, where we had about a 1.5% increase in volume every year. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're, we did see that increase in mortality and removals, which is leading to that. Um, so talking a little bit about uh, some stressors of Ohio's forest ecosystem health and vitality, uh, things like wildfire, that can be an issue in different parts of the state, uh, forest health, um, there are insect pressures like emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, gypsy moth, and hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, diseases like oak wilt, beech leaf disease, white oak mortality, and thousand cankers disease. Uh, there's some new and emerging threats on the horizon that we haven't yet detected in Ohio, but uh, seem to be coming our way. Things like spotted lanternfly and laurel wilt that affects sassafras and spicebush here in Ohio and other species in, in different parts of the country, uh, as well as non-native invasive plants. They have a major impact. Uh, and of course, uh, changing climate that can, can you know, bring a whole range of impacts to Ohio's forests. Um, this is just a, a short list of some of the worst invasive plants that we're dealing with in Ohio's forests. You know, these can outcompete native plants. Um, they can really reduce habitat quality for a lot of wildlife as well. Um, some invasive plants are really prevalent. 96% um, of those Forest Service FIA plots in Ohio contained one or more invasive species. Uh, and multiflora rose was the most commonly observed in 2016. So climate change impacts, um, there's a great publication, the Central Appalachians Forest Ecosystem Vulnerability Assessment that discusses potential impacts of a changing climate on different uh, forest types in Ohio and the region. Um, and other impacts may come with this as well. Extreme weather events, uh, increased drought, um, you know, greater facilitation of invasion by invasive species and potential increased wildfire. Uh, this is just some, some climate data that we see over time, changing plant hardiness zones, uh, looking at 1990 to 2015, and then some projected uh, plant hardiness zones out to 2070 to 2099. Um, and we can see that, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of warming occurring, and this can have obviously implications for uh, forest ecosystems. Um, so we have a forest action plan. It's essentially a, a, a strategic plan for Ohio's forests. And we're, we're just completing the 10 year update to this plan. Um, but it, it's an assessment of the current forest resource conditions in the state. And it's also a long term uh, forest resource strategy document. And these are the key threats that were identified to Ohio's forests in 2010. Uh, we haven't published the 10-year update here for 2020 yet, but I will tell you this, these key threats, much of them are largely still uh, factors today. So, you know, low incentives for private landowners to retain forests and manage them sustainably, inadequate funding for conservation programs, poor timber harvesting practices on private lands, um, and a whole list of issues there. Um, so out of those, we came up with six key issues facing Ohio's forests. Um, and these again are largely the same 10 years later here in 2020. Um, and just wrapping up here, uh, for folks that do own woods, what can they do? How can they manage sustainably? Um, obviously, you know, every landowner is gonna be a bit different in their objectives for their land. Uh, whether they, you know, want to make money from a timber harvest, uh, improve wildlife habitat, uh, 
you know, do more recreation on their land. Um, and there's programs that can reduce the tax uh, on, their, on that forested property. So determining um, the type of assistance needed, there's various sources of information. Um, there's professional advice out there for you. <laughs> I am not sure what this slide was, was in reference to that Cotton had in here, but um, I don't think this is Ohio. Looks like a, a bear release here, but, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Mark knows what this is and can talk <laughs> about it after me. <laughs> maybe one um, change we're not having to deal with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little scary. Um, so getting woodland management assistance, uh, we urge folks to contact the natural resources professional about managing their woodlands. Um, the Division of Forestry has service foresters that, you know, their whole purpose of their job is to work with private landowners on managing their forest resource. Um, you know, they can evaluate and inventory uh, your forest for you and help you develop a plan uh, going forward to reach your, your, your management goals. Um, so I mentioned the ODNR service foresters. There's also private consultant foresters that can assist with this. Um, Ohio Woodland Stewards Program and OSU Extension, uh, Cooperative Extension can, can assist with this. ODNR has, uh, Division of Wildlife has wildlife biologists that help on private lands. Um, and uh, so touch and base with your OSU Extension Office, your Soil and Water Conservation District for your county, uh, also USDA, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and Farm Services Administration can, can help you with that as well. And so that's, that's all uh, that I had here today. And uh, be happy to take questions or, or can, can handle that after Mark's talk, whatever works. Great, thanks Tom, that was awesome. Really good information. Um, so we are going to have a question and answer session at the end with all of our speakers. Um, so if you have questions, uh, you can enter them in the chat window or the Q&A box, which is in the bottom uh, ribbon at the bottom of your, uh, your Zoom screen. Um, the only difference really, if, if you want to have some sort of um, anonymity with your question, you can do that within the Q&A box. Otherwise, just feel free to put it in the chat window, uh, whatever you're more comfortable with. And I see we already have some questions coming in, some really good questions so far, so keep them coming. Um, and we also have Julie Strausser and Danny Gillies that are helping us out this morning. They're monitoring the chat window and the Q&A box as well. So I wanted to say thanks to them as well. All right, well, we're gonna move into our final speaker this morning. We have Mark Wiley with us. Mark is with the uh, Ohio Division of Wildlife. He's a wildlife biologist, specifically the forest game bird biologist for the state. So Mark, welcome. He's gonna talk a little bit about the wildlife side of things. All right, you can hear me, I hope. Yes, you're good to go. I've got to get my buttons figured out here. I'm advancing without. Well, we'll just start from there. Uh, <laughs> yes. When I move to presentation screen, I get nothing but the presentation. Can you use your uh, keyboard arrows to move forward and backwards? I'm trying, but it seems I can only move one direction. Mark, do you Not have a more than deal. do you have more than one monitor? No. Okay. Here, let me see if I can. Yeah, if you want to reshare, that's that's fine. If you want to go back to the beginning. Oh, we'll just get started. Not my only technical issue today. I was <laughs> telling everybody in the chat box to pay attention to specific points in Tom's presentation because they were going to be relevant for the wildlife presentation. And then one of the administrators uh, let me know that I wasn't speaking to the whole group. So I was sending reminders just to, to Dave and Marnie and Tom and others. <laughs> so I apologize for that. I hope you all, all were paying attention. Uh, because we are going to, we're going to reference a lot of what Tom talked about in forest changes. And I'm going to speak to you specifically 
about how those changes have impacted wildlife in Ohio. Uh, as the Ohio life, as the Ohio landscape changed over the past 200 years, there have been some dramatic impacts on wildlife distribution and abundance uh, for a number of species. And so I'll add a few caveats. I am not a historian. Uh, so much of what I'm drawing on here is, is old records, uh, which I'd be happy to share with any of you if you have interest. Old papers from uh, not only OSU, but the Department of Natural Resources. Um, some of them are conflicting in dates and, and so forth. So if you see an extirpation date that, that you've seen a different year uh, published at other, in other places, uh, I apologize. I, I tried to get ballpark figures and, and keep the presentation uh, pretty streamlined. So and the other caveat I'll add, uh, I'm gonna focus mostly on terrestrial vertebrates, specifically birds and mammals. Uh, the changes that, that Tom discussed uh, over the past 200 years in the Ohio landscape had profound impacts on wildlife of all types, including invertebrates, fish, and other things. Um, but uh, my expertise falls within terrestrial vertebrates, and specifically game species uh, is my responsibility, as, as Marnie mentioned, uh, game birds uh, for the most part. And so I'm going to draw on a few. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk specifically about a few of those species as we work through the Ohio's history. Um, and then the other uh, the other reason for that is a lot of our older accounts of wildlife abundance are accounts of game abundance. So folks that were exploring Ohio or settling Ohio, uh, they often made records of abundance of game and 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 didn't address some of the non-game uh, species, at least in detail, uh, as frequently. So uh, the slide that we ended up on, and I can't seem to uh, retrace my steps back from, is a diagram of Ohio around the year 1803. This is a diagram that was prepared by the Division of Wildlife, uh, I think for the bicentennial of, of uh, statehood for, for Ohio. 1803 is the year Ohio became the 17th state in the Union. And as Tom, dis uh, as Tom discussed, uh, the state was, was uh, almost entirely forested at that point. <clears throat> so 95% uh, forested with, with small pockets of prairie and marshland, which, which had significant impact on the wildlife that were present within the state, but for the most part, a heavily forested state. Uh, I've often heard it said a squirrel could travel from the Ohio River to Lake Erie without ever touching the ground. Uh, whether that's accurate or not, I don't know, but it, it, it highlights the, the, the nature of the extensive forest of Ohio at the time. So within this forested system, there were a number of iconic North American species, uh, not typically associated with Ohio today. Uh, that's because many of these species were extirpated from Ohio in the 1800s. You'll hear me use that term a number of times, extirpated. Uh, it generally means the species has gone from an area, in this case, the state of Ohio, but the species still exists el elsewhere. It's not extinct. Uh, unfortunately, there are a few species that did go in, extinct entirely, and, and I'll, I'll talk about those uh, later on. I'll also reference figures on this map throughout the talk. I should point out that the locations of the figures have no real geographic significance, at least not that I'm aware of. Uh, the images simply, simply signify the presence of the species in the state at that time. <clears throat> so in 1803, as I mentioned, the, the state was almost entirely fo forested, and you found forest species like snowshoe hare, porcupine, passenger pit, pigeon, wolves, cougar, elk, bison, you see represented in the, in the uh, figure. Forests at that time were undoubtedly impacted by, by humans. Uh, the extent of Native American influence on forest composition and structure at that time uh, is somewhat debated. Uh, whether, whether they had significant impact through fire or, or agriculture. Um, the absolute impact of, of Native Americans at, in the 18th and 19th century is, uh, is certainly uncertain, uh, but their influence was relatively small compared to the broad-scale deforestation following European-American settlement 
which began, as Tom pointed out, in southeastern counties around 1788. These settlers impacted uh, Ohio wildlife directly through hunting and trapping, uh, which was almost entirely unregulated until 1829 when we saw the first uh, regulations on muskrat trapping. Um, <clears throat> these settlers also impacted wildlife indirectly, you might say, through uh, forest clearing, which uh, I probably don't have to tell you has, has a dramatic impact on the habitat available to many of the wildlife species you see in the figure. <clears throat> Forests were not only cleared for agriculture, but also in the interest of mining, salt, and steel industries, which required large supplies of wood uh, for fuel and charcoal, for fuel and charcoal. I won't get into the history of these industries, but if you have interest, I highly recommend uh, visiting some of the state parks, state forests in Southeast Ohio that have these furnaces and, and learning more about the, the history of uh, Southeast Ohio and, and, and so forth. It's, it's very interesting stuff. But back to our map. So uh, I've advanced unintentionally to the point of extirpation and extinction of some of these uh, charismatic wildlife species. Uh, by 1803, we'd already lost uh, the bison. So bison were present in Ohio, which, which may surprise some of you, maybe not others. Uh, while not as abundant in the plain states, it, not, while not as abundant in Ohio as in the plain states, uh, records from the late 1700s suggest herds of several hundred animals could be found about uh, ar along many of Ohio's major rivers, including Muskingum and Scioto River. Uh, they were killed commercially for their meat and hide, uh, and they were considered rare by 1790. The last recorded bison in Ohio was shot and killed in Lawrence County in 1803. Now I can't advance forward, Marnie. Are you able to hear me? There we go, okay. Elk and cougar or mountain lion. Uh, and the date on mountain lion is a little bit tricky as uh, um, they were often referred to as panther and it's unclear uh, whether panther meant bobcat, lynx, cougar, or, uh, or both, all of the above. Um, but by approximately 1838, we had lost elk and mountain lion or cougar in, in the state of Ohio. Um, according to some old accounts that I found, I found pretty interesting, when Circleville was first settled in 1811, the carcasses and skeletons of approximately 50 elk were scattered about the surface. surface. Uh, that was an old account uh, from A.W. Brayton found in the Ohio History Connection archives. Uh, elk were at, commonly seen in Ashtabula County until about 1832, and then, as I mentioned, uh, were extirpated from the state in 1838. As we move forward in time, black bear, bobcat, beaver, snowshoe hare, and wolves disappeared by 1850. Uh, the dates varied here, but by, by 1850, uh, it was uh, largely agreed that these species uh, were gone. Um, beaver, uh, following decades of intense trapping, uh, um, bobcat similarly uh, persecuted like other large carnivores, wolves, bears, um, seen as threats to livestock and, uh, and other things uh, were, were pretty much killed on site, trapped and poisoned uh, during this time. Uh, the, last, the last wolf uh, was killed in Ohio in approximately 1842. Snowshoe hares, uh, I've, been, I've thrown those in there. They have an interesting history in Ohio. They were native just to the northeast corner of the state uh, and, and extirpated approximately 1850. Uh, we'll get, we can maybe talk about uh, snowshoe hare in a little more detail if we have some time, but uh, they've been reintroduced a number of times to northeast Ohio uh, as recently as the early 2000s. Uh, unfortunately, uh, none of those have, have been 
have been successful. And I did mention we've had extinctions within the state uh, and, and extinctions period, I guess, in the case of the passenger pigeon. But a unique history in Ohio as well. Uh, once thought to be the most numerous avian species on the planet, uh, they went extinct in the early 1900s. Um, it's believed hunting was the primary contributor to their extinct, extinction. It's not well, really well known, however, that in Ohio, the, these birds were protected from market hunting by law passed in 1876, which made it unlawful to take or destroy wild pigeons in roosting places uh, or discharge firearms in, in the proximity of those roosting places. Um, these uh, restrictions may have delayed the final demise uh, of the passenger pigeon, but certainly did not prevent it. Undoubtedly, uh, passenger pigeons were also impacted by deforestation, as it was known. Uh, they, they heavily utilized hard mast from a number of deciduous tree species. And the last bird was shot in Ohio in, in 1900. Uh, while the last bird held in captivity died in 1914, uh, I believe in a zoo in Cincinnati. <laughs> so with that, uh, a few that are less commonly known, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into the early 1900s here uh, with white-tailed deer, river otter, and wild turkey. Uh, white-tailed deer were actually extirpated from the state of Ohio, uh, which is kind of hard to imagine. Um, extirpated in 1904 and reintroductions occurred in the early uh, 1900s um, and we'll, we'll get into those a little bit more later in the presentation. But similar with wild turkey uh, with the loss of all the forested habitat and unregulated uh, harvest for a, a large portion of that time, uh, wild turkey were extirpated from, from the state. <laughs> Interesting though that not all species were losers in, in this forest clearing, um, at least initially. There were a number of species that, that ben benefited greatly and I'm going to talk about rough grouse and northern Bob White a number of times in the presentation in part because I'm a game bird biologist, uh, but squirrel is in there uh, as well. So clearings made by the, the first settlers were small openings in the forest often following river corridors. Uh, these, these openings created forest edge habitat, which were tremendously valuable to species like rough grouse, uh, which it's a common misconception that, that uh, species like rough grouse were abundant in Ohio um, dur during the time that Ohio was completely forested. They're, they're not typically associated with mature forest that would have existed at that time, and they probably were reliant on natural disturbances in the forest canopy and probably only thrived in those areas. Similar with Bob White, a, a species considered native to Ohio, but not typically associated with mature deciduous forests. And they probably were limited to uh, prairie, er prairie areas and forest openings like I described. Uh, squirrel is another interesting one. So as, as forest openings were carved and agriculture started to make its way into, into those areas, it's thought squirrel populations benefited greatly from, from crops um, planted in those areas, the food resources available. And they benefited to such a degree that in 1807, a law required Ohioans to provide a number of squirrel pelts uh, or face a tax penalty. Uh, just an interesting bit of Ohio history. As we move into the 1900s, um, as Tom described, much of the forest had been cleared um, and, and you basically had small farms, agriculture uh, throughout the state of Ohio with a few run areas of, of forest habitat. And this was a time for Ohio wildlife when farmland adapters and invaders uh, sort of thrived. And the images you see here are, are largely small game and small carnivores um, that, that would have done well within that landscape. Um, <clears throat> so in the, uh, let me advance here, or I've already got it. So a, a few examples of that, ring neck pheasant, which was an int introduced Asian species and the Hungarian or gray partridge from Europe, 
these were introduced into the state of Ohio, uh, not species that you would ever associate with forest, but again, within this landscape of the early 1900s, they thrived uh, in the Ohio landscape on small farms, uh, utilizing small grain fields, pastures, and, and so forth. Um, similarly, coyotes moved into the state around uh, this time. The first observation I could find was 1919. Uh, these were a, a western species that were probably excluded from Ohio by, by large uh, carnivores, specifically wolves, uh, probably did not tolerate the presence of coyotes prior to this, but with the removal of those competitors, uh, coyotes were able to find their way into Ohio and other eastern states from the west. <clears throat> I'll back to uh, rough grouse and northern Bob White. It's an interesting time, the early 1900s. Uh, so from from the booming populations of the late 1800s that I described, where these species were were uh, often uh, pursued by market hunters and and, and harvested in mass. Uh, there are even accounts of Bob White being driven into nets uh, to be uh, harvested and sold in cities uh, by the hundreds and thousands. Uh, by the 1900s, when, when Ohio had largely been cleared for agriculture, uh, these species populations crashed, and we actually see a number of pretty strict hunting restrictions on, uh, uh, on both Bob White and, and rough grouse. Bob, Northern Bob White as an example, was listed as a songbird and the, the hunting season closed for a time in the early 1900s because populations <clears throat> were so low. Um, and then as we move into the, the middle part of the 20th century, uh, things begin to change. Again, as uh, hopefully you were all paying attention to Tom's presentation. So, some of the farms, uh, uh, socioeconomic and environmental factors uh, that made farming very difficult in portions of, of eastern and southern Ohio led to widespread farm abandonment in these areas and subsequent reforestation. Um, so forests begin to reclaim these areas in, in southern and, and eastern Ohio. And with that, we started to see changes in our wildlife communities at this time, the, the 1950s, 1960s, and into the 70s. As I mentioned, as, those, as forests moved back into the state, uh, we had reintroduction and recolonization of a, a number of, of our, our forest species. Um, uh, some of these uh, made it back into the state under their own power, uh, as, as an example, black bear, bobcat, uh, and others. Uh, a few of them needed a little help. We had reintroductions of white-tailed deer, and, and uh, wild turkey is one of the most uh, significant success stories in wildlife re reintroduction in the eastern half of North America, but in Ohio specifically. That effort began in the 1950s and was wildly successful. It was long uh, thought during that reintroduction period that wild turkey would never expand outside of southeast Ohio where we had these, these new forests growing. And uh, wild turkey showed us they're far more adaptable uh, than we originally believed. And we now have wild turkey in all 88 counties, even highly agricultural counties. And then again, I'll, I'll jump back to uh, rough grouse and northern Bob White, with which I've, I've worked my entire career nearly. Um, during this period of re reforestation, these species that were, are highly reliant on early successional habitat uh, uh, went from lows, uh, population lows, to absolutely booming populations um, through the 60s, 70s, and, and into the 80s. Uh, so, as, as these farm areas were reclaimed by forest, uh, they created the brushy young forest habitat, which is ideal for these species in their respective regions of the state. Uh, Northern Bob White are a much more farm oriented species, uh, often associated with grassland and brushland habitat, where the rough grouse is a forest species. 
Uh, so they're, they're, their habitats don't overlap perfectly, but they are early successional habitat specialists uh, and, and require that, that sort of brushy young forest habitat. So populations exploded during the middle of the, the 20th century, um, which, which has created some interesting uh, uh, sort of mindsets in, in those in folks that are interested in these two species. And I can touch on that a little bit more uh, as we move uh, into the uh, 2000s. Well, I guess maybe I, I prepared some slides to, to highlight some of that. So uh, on top, uh, the top slide is, is uh, all of our historic information on total grouse hunters and total grouse harvest, uh, which is one of the best long-term indices we have for rough grouse numbers in the state of Ohio. We weren't running surveys through all of that time, but we were trying to track uh, both grouse hunters and grouse harvest. And so what you see on the far left end of the, the graph in the 1940s, when we still uh, didn't have much forest within the state, uh, less than 4 million acres, as indicated by the green line in the bottom graph. Um, you didn't have many rough grouse uh, being harvested. You didn't have many hunters interested in pursuing rough grouse. And then uh, again, that bottom slide, the bottom graph, with the green line increasing shows total forest acres in the state through the years. The orange line represents uh, total acres of small diameter forest. So some of what Tom mentioned before, um, you see that, that number in decreasing even as we add forest acres uh, to the state. Uh, looking back at, at rough grouse hunter numbers and harvest, you, we see a peak through the 1970s and 80s uh, a time when we had uh, nearly 4 million acres of young forest habitat within the state, um, rough grouse numbers actually absolutely boomed. And as we've lost that young forest habitat, even though, as I mentioned, we're gaining forest habitat through much of that time, uh, we see rough grouse numbers declining. So uh, into the 2000s. Um, it shows the state much like we see it today. Uh, the state, this diagram was prepared in 2003, uh, but uh, much like Tom said with forest cover, uh, wildlife uh, populations have not changed uh, too dramatically from that time, although a number of these species we'll see in a few diagrams uh, have increased in, in number. Um, So what we see uh, is, is sort of a, in the Ohio landscape is sort of a transition of intense agriculture in the Northwest corner, uh, transition area between uh, the Northwest and the Southeast, uh, and then heavily forested areas in the Southeast corner of the state, Eastern portion of the state, where we see a lot of our forest species and scattered throughout our, our large or urban areas, which are significant because that in, those urban uh, areas, developed areas, impact what, what wildlife are able to occupy those places. Uh, and I mentioned we've had a number of, of wildlife successes uh, in, in the most recent decades. Uh, restoration efforts of a number of species, wild turkey, white-tailed deer, uh, recolonization of species like black bear and bobcat, and we'll get into a few examples here. This is a black bear photo taken by a trail cam, a sow with cubs, uh, which is significant because though we have black bear observations reported often in the state, uh, it's much more rare to get evidence of reproduction in the state of Ohio. In the, in the past few years, uh, with the prevalence of trail cams, trail cameras, uh, remotely activated cameras that, that capture movement. Uh, um, we're starting to see more evidence of black bear reproduction in the state of Ohio. And as you can see, this is, this is from earlier this year. Uh, forgive me, I don't have the county. Uh, this photo was taken, but I, I want to say Northeast Ohio, because that is one of the, the few places where we've had evidence of black bear reproduction previously. Just a few figures on, on black bear observations. Uh, the map on the left showing the, the number of observations uh, confirmed 
as you can see in the heavily forested areas of eastern and southeast Ohio, we get many more confirmed sightings of black bear. Uh, but they are occasionally seen in, in sort of that transition area I mentioned, and even in some of the, the intensely agricultural areas in, in northwest Ohio. And those sightings have generally been increasing through the years. If you look at the figure on the right, uh, showing not only all sightings, uh, unconfirmed, but confirmed sightings in red. Uh, the general trend has been increasing. American beaver, uh, another species extirpated in the 1800s. Uh, um, they had a little bit of help from the Division of Wildlife and its predecessors in, in not only, uh, but in distribution, I should say. You know, whether there was an initial reintroduction, uh, I'm not sure. But there, there were efforts to further distribute beaver in different areas of the state through the middle of the 20th century. And as you can see, they're widely distributed now. Uh, and in the next figure, we'll see they've, they've stabilized in recent years, but uh, certainly increasing through the 1970s, 80s, and into the early 2000s. Bobcat, another one of our predators extirpated. Uh, uh, over 100 years ago, has made its way back into eastern Ohio, and like black bear, occasionally shows up in the western half of the state. Um, but we've got a number of interesting research efforts going on with Ohio University and others, and in trying to assess the, the bobcat population and its status in, in the state of Ohio. But in general, you can see uh, observations, at least observations that we have collected, um, have been increasing. Uh, the caveat there is, as I mentioned, trail cameras, security cameras, and so forth are far more prevalent in recent years than they were in, in the past. So that may have some impact on the level of effort out there uh, or the opportunity to capture a bobcat sighting and confirm it. And wild turkey. Uh, I mentioned one of the most successful uh, restoration efforts in, in Eastern uh, North America, but in Ohio specifically, the, those efforts started uh, in the late 50s. Uh, Ohio received wild turkey uh, from, from a number of states ranging from uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, Tennessee, Missouri, uh, I think even in, into Florida and Texas. Um, uh, approximately 200 birds were part of that initial uh, reintroduction and they 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 thrived in this in the forests of southeast ohio and by 1966 we had our first modern turkey season in in limited counties within the state and then numbers increased rapidly um, and have seemed to have reached their peak in the early 2000s and sort of leveled off as turkeys occupied all 88 counties and and presumably occupied all available habitat uh, forest habitat within the state and sort of reached reached a plateau at that time. Uh, turkey numbers certainly, uh, like our other forest species, are best in eastern Ohio and southeast Ohio. This is spring turkey harvest for the 2020 season, so you can see uh, some of those heavily forested counties in the east and even uh, the transitional counties in, in west central Ohio are some of our best Turkey counties as, as uh, those species benefit not only from forest habitat, but uh, a little bit of, of forest opening and agricultural habitat. That was just to highlight a few of, of the success stories in the state. Uh, I did mention, I, I think I forgot to put an X through snowshoe hare uh, up there in the northeast corner, but it is believed at this point that snowshoe hare is again extirpated from the state of Ohio following efforts in the early 2000s to, to reintroduce it. Um, so I, I, I can, I can, I'd be happy to talk with anybody more about snowshoe hare if they're interested. I just suggest you contact me uh, following presentations. But I'd like to wrap up with uh, many of the challenges that, that Tom uh, described and Cotton, and I actually stole a, a, a bit of text from their presentation and forests are now, are now fragmented uh, to a degree. They're maturing uh, and they're shifting in species composition. And this has positive and negative effects on different wildlife species, depending on their habitat needs. Uh, 
just like the transition from, from all forest within the state to all agriculture, there were winners and there were losers. Um, and, and our task in, in the Division of Forestry, Division of Wildlife, and, and just as Ohioans in general interested in this public resource is to sort of balance balance those those habitat needs and make sure that we've got a place for for all of these species within the state and then lastly there uh, tom touched on climate changing climate changing patterns of land ownership uh, threats to an, of invasive species um, all of these are are worth noting and i'm not an expert on any of them and can't speak to them to any degree but what i will tell you is is each of these things has an impact on the suitability of a landscape to support wildlife populations and so the reason that we bring them up is because these impact uh, forest management and therefore impact the habitat available species um, and the species that the, the state can support A great example of that, which uh, I'll bring up again, is rough grouse, which have reached uh, historic lows even back to the 1940s when, when populations were extremely uh, low. So drumming counts, which are highlighted in the red line, and then flush rate uh, based on uh, diary information from a group of dedicated grouse hunters that submit their hunt information every year. Uh, so these these indices for rough grouse abundance have reached uh, reached historic lows, as I mentioned, and this is largely due to the absence of, of of adequate young forest habitat within our forested systems in Ohio. And uh, I, I touched on these graphs a little bit earlier, but as you can see, that young forest, the orange line on the bottom graph, the the total acres of small diameter forest. And this is just one example uh, of sort of a, a weak link in the chain where um, rough grouse and other young species dependent on young forest habitat probably need a little bit of help from wildlife managers uh, to make sure that, that they remain on, on the Ohio landscape. We'll never see the numbers that we did in past decades, and that's a difficult message for a lot of people interested in rough grouse, or maybe they can remember the, the late 70s and early 80s when rough grouse were extremely abundant. Uh, we can't get back to that, but with a little bit of help from forest managers and wildlife managers, we can hopefully make a place for all, all wildlife species and all their habitat needs. So uh, with that, I will leave you with my favorite quote uh, from Charles Dombach, who uh, I believe was a, a professor in, in the OSU uh, School of uh, Zoology and Entomology in the mid 20th century. Uh, this is from a publication he wrote in 1948 on hunting regulations and the importance of landscape suitability uh, for, for wildlife populations in Ohio. And it says the chief factor in determining long-term trends in game populations, and we can say wildlife populations here, uh, but he was specifically focused on game in this paper. But the chief factor is land use, and only insofar as, as the major use of the land can be modified to meet the needs of wildlife can any appreciable influence on game populations be expressed. Uh, the importance there is, is uh, for, for a talk like this, is I want to highlight that we have impact on on forest habitat in the way that we use it and manage it. And that's why it's vitally important uh, to, as Tom mentioned, contact natural resource professionals, uh, service foresters within the Division of, of Forestry, uh, private lands biologists within the Division of Wildlife to help you in meeting land management goals uh, on your forested acres. And, and the challenge there is, is your property or, or any property that you have influence over is just one piece of the puzzle. And, and to influence the landscape at a scale that impacts a lot of these populations, we've got to put together a lot of pieces of the puzzle. And Tom highlighted some of that in, in his discussion of, of land management, or excuse me, land ownership patterns and, and changes. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions um, or maybe we open to the group for, for questions about Tom's presentation or mine. 
Great, thank you, Mark. Very, very interesting. I think it's so important that we have knowledge of where we've, um, where we've come from to be able to move forward uh, when it comes to managing our forest and wildlife resources. So thanks, Mark and Tom, for excellent talks. So yeah, let's get to some questions. Um, there were several questions in the Q&A box and um, uh, Dave uh, has been answering those and then Tom answered uh, one as well. So if you did enter a question in, in the Q&A box, uh, please check those answers. Um, and then I think we have them all answered. Okay. Uh, I see one, Marnie. Uh, yeah, go what ahead, is Marnie. the estimated population of resident black bears in Ohio? And I do not have an answer for you there. Uh, we track um, our, our fur bear, bear biologist, Katie Dennison, might, might uh, be able to assist. Uh, and, and I didn't put my contact information in there, but I can certainly try to make that connection if I need to. But we, we largely track observations, uh, which doesn't give us a great index for total population size. That's, that's what I've, that's what I usually report to you um, as well, Mark. Um, yeah, we, we don't have a good estimate on the exact number. Um, I think I've seen 50 to 100 kind of tossed around, but again, it's a big question mark since it's, uh, it's not exactly what, what's being tracked. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna start going down through the other questions that are coming in. So Barry Taylor is asking, um, Tom mentioned corporate land ownership. Are these companies with trees on their campus properties or are they timber companies? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think <clears throat> probably most of that acreage is, uh, you know, timber, management company that owns significant acreage of forest, uh, mostly in the southern part of the state. But I think it could be, you know, any company or business owning land with forest on it, but probably a good bit of it are those um, timber companies. Tom, um, another big uh, source of that is uh, like AEP and coal companies right. and companies like that own big yep. lands too. Yep, absolutely. Um, Deborah asked in the beginning where the forest uh, cover now map was, uh, where you can access it. And uh, Danny did reply in the comments. Um, it's from the National Land Cover Database. Okay. And then uh, quite a few questions in the chat box. So first we have um, from Kathy, could the increase in the rural urban interface also be the result of people letting more area go back to forest? Um, that is near urban areas? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I doubt there's enough of that happening near urban areas or highly populated areas to register a whole lot there. I do think most of it is, um, you know, development and housing density moving into those rural areas would be my guess. I, I'm not intimately familiar with the data sets and all that went into it, but um, that's my assumption there. Okay. Um, another question, the beach is also negative net growth. Is there disease there or is it also being shaded out as with elms? Yeah, that's an interesting one too. Um, that I think beach showed as a, as a 0.8 uh, for uh, growth to removal ratio there. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's an issue of them being shaded out with forest maturing because they are uh, a shade tolerant late successional species that, um, that should do very well in, in a closed canopy forest. Um, there are some disease issues with American beach. There's uh, beach bark disease and beach leaf disease that are impacting it mainly in the northeastern part of the state. Although those really aren't doing, causing a whole lot of mortality at this point in Ohio. So I, I doubt that's having much of an impact there. So I, I don't really know exactly why we're seeing that, um, you know, negative net growth with American beach. Um, I, it'd be interesting to go back and see what that growth rate has done over the last 
decade or two. I'm not sure what the trend is with American Beach, but that, that is an interesting one that I'm not exactly sure why it's, it's showing that. Okay, question from Ron. The, the charts and graphs for Ohio forests are very informative. Are these figures available for just Ohio State owned forests? How do state managed forests compare with Ohio forests overall? Yeah, so the, the data that I shared um, was statewide data on all land ownerships uh, from the US Forest Service FIA program. Uh, I, I don't know that we have the exact equivalent data sets for state owned forests, um, but we could probably get at some of that with the information that we do have. And, um, you know, I, I think there would be some differences that we would see because, you know, a lot of the, the state owned forest land is probably more actively managed uh, for various, you know, management goals than a lot of private land is. Um, so, you know, at, at least with on state, within state forests, we have a multiple use mandate. So, you know, we're doing forest management for a variety of reasons that would probably change some of those figures if you were only looking at, at state forest land. Um, you know, other state owned land, whether it's state parks or nature preserves or, or wildlife areas have slightly different management goals. Um, but yeah, so no, the, the data I showed was all land ownership across the whole state. Um, I don't think at this time we have the exactly equivalent data that we could share for state-owned land, but um, we could certainly get some of that data too. Great. I'll give you a break, Tom. Uh, Mark, Tracy asks, I heard Bob Whites often as a youth in the Hamilton County area, but I haven't heard one in many years. Has weather impacted their population or hunting, which has impacted their hunting or their, their populations more? Um, and is there a way to bring them back to the area? Yeah, great questions. Um, so I would say weather more. Um, we actually have very little evidence that hunting has, in, has had impact on uh, northern Bob Whites. And, actually, and part of the, the paper uh, I quoted at the end of my presentation by Charles Dombach was on uh, hunting restrictions for northern Bob White through the early part of the 20th century. And his conclusion was they had no impact at all. Um, that is hunting restriction. So Bob White are, are at the northern end of their range in Ohio and are therefore pretty severely impacted by winter. Uh, so the blizzards of the late 70s were certainly impactful, impactful for that population. I believe the figure is we lost more than 90% of our Bob Whites in, a, in just a, a very short period of time. But it's important to point out that the Ohio landscape changed dramatically during that period as well. Bob White numbers were already declining prior to those blizzards. The blizzards were just sort of uh, a na the last nail in the coffin, you might say. Uh, the last question, is there a way to bring them back to the area? Um, the abundant northern Bob White populations that you might recall from previous decades were a product of land management at that time. So the way to bring them back is to find a way to produce Bob White habitat within uh, our land management activities currently. We've made some efforts to do that in Southwest Ohio where we still have remnant Bob White populations. It is a challenge though. It's a challenge to incorporate uh, habitat management practices within active farmland or forestland. Um, and so you're, you're fighting an uphill battle, unfortunately. Thanks. Uh, Ron asks another great question. In some uh, countries, ecotourism has been recognized uh, as a very valuable revenue resource. Are you aware of any increased efforts by Ohio to gain more revenue from ecotourism rather than clear cutting of forest land for revenue? Um, I, I'm not aware of any specific efforts, although uh, within the Division of Wildlife, we certainly recognize uh, within the birding community that some of these rare species, uh, including rough grouse, uh, there's intense interest in finding you know, and accessing drumming logs and, and being able to observe birds in their pretty unique uh, displays, uh, which unfortunately are becoming increasingly rare. Uh, 
Um, so, so though no specific entrant interest or no specific um, motion toward ecotourism that I know of, but we recognize that it's it's becoming part of of uh, the future for these species. Referencing uh, forest land for revenue, uh, I might maybe defer to Tom there as he might have a better understanding of how the state utilizes uh, clear cuts uh, and the, the revenues associated with clear cuts within the Division of Wildlife. Um, such actions are, are typically taken for the, the habitat benefit uh, that they produce, uh, both in creation of young forest, which we recognize is needed in some areas, uh, but then also in, in uh, promotion of oak regeneration. Um, you'll see some of that done in Southeast Ohio associate, and, and other actions, including controlled burns and so forth. So, so within the Division of Wildlife, our primary focus is on habitat and providing habitats for those species that need them. Uh, so uh, I, I know very little about clear-cutting revenue within the Division of Wildlife. Yeah, um, just to add to that, um, I, I'm not aware of all the, you know, uh, ecotourism efforts going on. I will mention, though, I, I think I recently heard of a, a group, um, you know, actively promoting that sort of stuff. I think it's the, uh, the acronym is ORCA, uh, Outdoor Recreation Council of Appalachia, I believe, um, that I recently heard about that I think that's one of their main focuses. So that's, you know, the focus there is southeastern Ohio, but um, I'm sure there's other efforts that that I'm not aware of and, and maybe our uh, Division of Parks and Watercraft may have additional information on that that front. Um, yeah, and as far as clear cuts, um, you know, I I can't speak to all of our, our land management goals. I'm not too involved in that program within our division on our state forest, but I think those like marks that are, are often used to, um, you know, increase wildlife habitat for the benefit of, of early successional species. Um, there may be some other management goals uh, that that's why that those are used as well. Um, and then of course on private land, we have our state service foresters that uh, work with landowners to, you know, perform sustainable management to reach landowner management goals. So we're actively trying to reach a lot more private landowners so that, you know, more private landowners are doing sustainable timber harvest if that's one of the goals that they have. So that that's a huge effort that we're trying to do is reach, reach more private landowners because as we saw, most of Ohio's forests are, are privately owned. A couple more questions here before we wrap up. Julie asks, what are the theories relating to decreased numbers of chestnut oak, white oak, and American beech? I know you kind of addressed the beech already, but maybe you could speak on um, the oaks. Yeah, um, you know, I think, I think it does have a lot to do with uh, timber harvesting favoring oaks. Uh, they're one of the more valuable timber species. Uh, you know, the white oaks like chestnut oak and white oak um, are really desirable uh, wood products for, for various products. And so I think that's part of it. Uh, also, you know, we're not seeing a lot of regeneration of oak in our forest. So that, that's another uh, point of concern that we have and we're trying to improve regeneration of oak in our forest so that we can sustain that into the future. Uh, there's also been a few, you know, pest or disease issues of oaks over the years. There were uh, you know, some years where we had a lot of white oak mortality occurring, mostly in southern Ohio, and there really wasn't one specific pest or disease responsible for that. It seemed to be uh, a suite of different issues, insect and disease problems going on, impacting white oaks, but that seems to have slowed down lately. So um, hopefully that issue has improved, but I, I do think a lot of um, you know, not quite sustainable timber harvest is going on. That's another thing that we're trying to work with landowners on is uh, better timber harvest practices. And, and I don't, Dave may have more to add on the, the oak part of that too, but that's my 
my ideas there. Just briefly, um, it's we're realizing there are definitely some trends we're not not really or we're concerned about with Oak, and we're putting a lot of collaborative efforts. Um, all the organization, or all the agencies that have forestry in their mission statement are working together and focusing on that Oak issue um, on all lands, private, federal, and state. So it's it's a priority for us, and it really comes down to active management. Um, those species are dependent on disturbance and some of the disturbance regimes that have historically given them advantage of change. So um, that's a high area of focus for us right now. Okay, we had a few more questions coming in. Um, I do realize we're at 1130. Um, we'll stay on and keep answering questions, but if, if you do need to jump off, that is totally okay. But I, I, I at least want to make sure questions are answered. Dave, correct me if, if I'm wrong there. So, um, um, yes, we'll uh, stay on. And just a great. final reminder before you leave, um, all the presentations, the recordings will be there and any information that the speakers want posted with that, I'll post probably early next week on the web page that I'm going to stick in the uh, chat box here and, and I'll put it in before, but I'll put it in again and we can hang on as long as people have questions. Wonderful. Uh, Kathy asks, we are at 30% forest cover now. What do we think is the practical max to which we will ever get back? That's a good question. Um, you know, we obviously would love to see increased forest cover in the state, but uh, there's, there's a lot of factors affecting that. Um, you know, increasing population uh, is going to increase housing density and potentially increase loss of forest as, as development moves into those forested areas. Um, so that, it's a tough one to, to try to move the needle on because there's, there's so much impacting that. Um, you know, all we can look at now is, is where we've come and it seems like we've sort of leveled off uh, since about 1990. So we may stay there, uh, you know, it's a matter of trying to incentivize uh, forests to stay as forest, uh, which is a tough, tough thing to do. Um, so yeah, it, that's, a, that's a really big one and tough one to answer. I'd love to see that increase, um, but there's a lot of factors playing into that. Steve asks, uh, in central Ohio, residential developers often tend to clear smaller trees while avoiding larger ones, both to avoid local financial penalties associated with larger tree removal and to offer mature trees as a selling point. If there is also, if this is also the case in other parts of the state, or is this also the case in other parts of the state, um, and if so, might it contribute at least in small part to the trend of increased immature trees throughout the state and decline in smaller trees? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, that sort of suburban or urban sprawls, this development moving out into more rural areas uh, is definitely contributing um, to the fragmentation piece and, and possibly also the lack of young forest. Um, but yeah, I, I've seen that trend. I, I don't have a whole lot of data on how exactly that's happening, but, uh, but yeah, that, you know, that can be an issue. Um, also just for tree health, you know, when you, when you clear a forested area out and leave a few of the large trees there and build houses around them, a lot of times those trees struggle because, you know, you've changed a lot of the hydrology, the drainage, um, the wind pattern hitting that tree. And a lot of times those trees don't, don't last very long, but um, yeah, certainly that, that type of thing is contributing to fragmentation, um, you know, and, and also playing into age and size class diversity of, of Ohio's forest too. Uh, Melissa asks, is there a good reference for Bob White habitat if we as private landowners were interested in supporting that? Um, so there, there is an OSU fact sheet on bobwhite habitat. Um, Mark wrote it, <laughs> essentially. Um, so I will put that in the chat box. Mark, do you have any other resources that you'd like to share on that? 
Um, no, Marnie, and I, I can't take all the credit on that, certainly. Uh, I, there were multiple <laughs> authors, and I think you were one of them. Um, so uh, that fact sheet is, is one of the best that I can think of for the state of Ohio. It was completed by three graduate students that, that worked on Bob White Habitat uh, in Southeast Ohio in, in about a decade ago. Um, so it's, that it's <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that long ago. No. Um, but yeah, that, that's an excellent resource. And, and if you'd like more, uh, I think Dave will share my contact information. I'd be happy to talk Bob White Habitat as much as folks need to. A few comments. Uh, Barry says, uh, thanks for your reference to Charles Dombach. My father was a colleague and personal friend of his, and he would be glad to see one of his era uh, as being referenced in 2020. So very cool. And then Julie says, there is a tourism initiative in Southeast Ohio called The Winding Road, which is focusing on ecotourism in this area and providing authentic experiences. So that's Something to add to that, too, is uh, on the Wayne National Forest in the Athens area, there's a big effort on this Bailey's Bike uh, project, which could be huge for ecotourism in southeast Ohio as well. And that's a collaborative effort. Frank is wondering if we have considered incentivizing the reduction of lawns. I see so many places with large lawns that are an urban desert. <laughs> Um, I suppose I can take that one from the Division of Wildlife perspective. Uh, certainly, <laughs> as I drive through uh, neighborhoods and in rural areas, uh, I, certain, I see lawns as wasted space for wildlife habitat. And I wonder uh, who these people are that might actually enjoy mowing lawns. And I know they are out there, but it is one of the things I hate most about the summer and if my wife would allow me, uh, our entire backyard would be songbird and rabbit habitat. Um, but I understand lawn mowing is a necessary evil. It's something that our private lands biologists, uh, I think, push with folks uh, to try to get some type of perennial vegetation that would be beneficial to either pollinators, which is vi are vitally important for a number of reasons, but then also uh, other species, like I mentioned, songbirds and so forth. Um, so that, that's my, my brief perspective on, on that. You make a very good point about uh, lawns as deserts. I, I agree completely with that. Um, and Mark, you and I have a similar philosophy, though unfortunately, my husband, for some reason, is trying to promote the lawn and I give him a hard time every single time he pulls a dandelion. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that is definitely a valid point, Frank. Uh, and I think there's definitely more and more efforts, at least I've seen in the past five years, um, to address some of these issues in, in our urban or, or fringe areas. Um, if you're familiar at all with the work of Douglas Talamy, he, that's kind of his big philosophy is how do we use our urban areas to promote uh, more green spaces that are, are good for our wildlife species. Um, so yeah, I think that's a big area. It's, it's one I'm definitely interested in. Um, and I, again, I see a lot of forward movement in that area here recently. So that's, that's promising. But yeah, continue to, for those of you that are still on, talk about that more, encourage your neighbors to think about what they can do in their backyards and, and some of those urban spaces to promote uh, our tree cover and our, our habitat. Um, so uh, Steve, kind of a similar comment, says uh, um, in major metropolitan areas like Columbus, uh, they're currently trying to significantly increase their urban tree canopy. So urban forest opportunities might be one area of potential tree increase in Ohio. I think that's right on, Steve. Uh, okay, and um, Matthew says, we have been purchasing residentially zoned woodlots, about 50 acre parcels in Cincinnati, many of them contiguous in order to preserve canopy and habitat. Awesome. Are there any USDA or other programs that support urban forest preservation specifically? Good question. That's a great question. Um, nothing is immediately popping into my head, but I, I, this 
would definitely be something to follow up with. Uh, we do have a, an urban forestry program in the Division of Forestry, and they may have ideas or, or more information on that topic um, than I'm aware of. So, um, yeah, feel free. I'll, I'll put my uh, contact info in the chat, and maybe um, you can uh, send me a message, and I'll, I'll see if there's something out there that might be in that, that kind of idea that you're, you're thinking of there. Um, do I think we have one last question? Um, I think maybe Tracy asked this. She said, uh, Arc of Appalachia manages many acres of forest in Ohio. Is there a list of organizations such as this one that can be supported to help prevent some of the fragmentation of forests? Um, a list of conservation organizations? Uh, that's a good question too. Um, I'm not sure if I know of a central place. Uh, you can feel free to contact me and I can, I can provide some of those to you. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is a, is a really large one in Ohio. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, Arc of Appalachia. There's also Edge of Appalachia. Um, and then there, you know, there's a handful of uh, um, oh, uh, lost what I was going to say, um, cons you know, land conservancy groups um, that that sort of do conservation easements and that sort of thing. So yeah, th I'm not sure if there is an actual list out there that I'm aware of. I'm not either. Okay. Wow, great questions, everyone. Um, I think we've gotten through all of them. If not, somebody jump in and let me know. I don't want to let a, uh, let a question go unanswered. Um, but I, I just sh saved the chat session, um, and maybe Dave, we can post that because there are a lot of good links and contact information um, in there as well. So um, I guess without any other questions, thank you so hey, much. Hey, Marnie, really Ooh, quick. Yeah. Um, ahead, Kelly yeah. Miller says that the USDA Forest Service also has state and private forestry branch for urban forestry. Wonderful. Thank you. And we did have one last minute question come in. Oh, I see. <laughs> are feral hogs a problem for Ohio forests? Yep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they definitely are. Um, it's, it's one I think I touched on briefly uh, in my invasive impacts on wildlife presentation, but I didn't go into too much detail. Yeah, um, we've had them here in Ohio for quite some time now. We do have some established populations in, in southern Ohio uh, within our forested areas. And yeah, they can be a, a huge problem. They are incredibly, uh, they can be incredibly destructive and unfortunately their populations reproduce very quickly. So it doesn't take them long to get a foothold uh, in the area. Good news is, is we do have several organizations working very closely uh, and successfully to monitor those populations and to eradicate them. Um, so if you look at, if you've seen some of the past maps of feral hog presence in Ohio, we have had some populations pop up in some of the northern counties. Um, thankfully, many of those, if not all of them, I think, have been eradicated. So um, I guess not to go on any further, if you ever see any evidence of feral swine or suspect that, do reach out to the Division of Wildlife and they will put you in contact with some folks to help you. There is also uh, a fact sheet on feral swine in Ohio um, through OSU um, and uh, I will link that down below as well. Um, and again, feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions on invasive impacts on wildlife. Steve Matthews was also with us for some time. Um, so if you, if you do end up watching his uh, climate change uh, webinar that he did, and if you have any questions, you can um, reach out to me and I'll, I'll get you in touch with him. But uh, thanks everyone so much. Yeah, good thank Julie. you, Marnie. We Hello. really appreciate your work and Mark's work and, and Tom and Cotton and Steve and and everybody that's helped us out with this. Um, I will post all these resources. I also have emails to everybody that participated. So when I have that posted, I will send an email with the link to where all the information is posted, hopefully by early next week, once I get copies of all the PowerPoints. So again, it's greatly appreciated. And hopefully everybody has time to spend a little time out in the woods for the rest of the day. We're cloudy down here and it's actually looks like it's pretty comfortable to be outside. So. Thanks, and everybody have a great day. Appreciate it. Again, thanks again so much, Mark and 
Marnie and Tom for presenting today. And Steve wasn't isn't still on, but if you don't have if you haven't done it, watch his talk as well. It's a great resource to think about our future and the effects of climate on our forests. So everybody have a great day. Bye everybody.